so that list tells you I just couldn't keep the job, right? <laughs> we, uh, first of all, thank you to Tyler, uh, Holly, uh, Mary, um, all the folks uh, who are getting us here, and Dean Templin for getting us involved with SVU. Actually, uh, anyway, uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time. By the way, we're using iPads. This is just a group of seniors can manage technology, despite the fact that my daughter says, Dad, watching you with technology is just painful. Uh, anyway, um, first of all, I got to So, dealing with entrepreneurs, or anybody actually, one of the questions I'd love to start with after playing the door is what is your risk profile? How much risk tolerance do you have? And what you'll learn as you listen to our little trip through the world is that ours was an evolving risk tolerance. Little by little we learned uh, to handle risk. And it was that that made us... Alright, what am I doing wrong? I'll do this one. That's what made us move from the idea of corporate gypsies after 17 relocations into the world of being an entrepreneur um, and then understanding where our risk tolerance lies we became interviewers. So how did this all start? I came off campus, got my first job with Union Carbide. Are you going to fix this for me or are you going <laughs> Union Carbide was one of the old you know, blue chips, 270 Park Avenue in New York. My dad was as proud as could be. Matter of fact, he looked at me and said, they're going to pay you $8,400 a year? All right. And, uh, and they gave you that car, and they're going to pay for the travel, and the gas, and all that. He said, son, don't you lose that job. So anyway, it was a little bothered. Uh, when I moved from Union Carbide uh, to Frito Lay. And Frito Lay was kind of a great move, but one of the things that Frito Lay, they went out and grabbed big managers from a bunch of companies, Union Carbide, Procter and Gamble, Johnson and Johnson. They wanted to build the organization, and they went through this designate program, which meant for the first three months you drove a route truck. So I went from Union Carbide, Park Avenue, to driving from route truck, and my dad thought I had just failed miserably. We lost a lot of work in MBAs. They didn't, you know, driving a route truck was beyond them. But anyway, then you ran a warehouse. Now you understood the system. And that's important. And we're going to talk about that a little later. Whatever business you get into, you really need to be a student of that business. And Frito Lay taught me the consumer products business in depth. Uh, they taught me retail operations in depth. And those two things really served me well as I moved along. Then we moved on along and uh, got a call from Headhunter. Love Headhunters, great people. Uh, you are just a piece of meat to these folks, but you're a nice one, you can pay their bills, but they get you in good places. And he brought me to an opportunity to join a couple other fellows in an LBA where we leverage the assets of the business, and now I'm an entrepreneur. And this is where I learned cash. And believe me, you want to understand cash and cash flow. If you don't have the finance background, get enough to really understand cash, cash, cash management, cash flow, or you're going to be in trouble. You don't you make payroll. That was a good uh, start, our first chance to be a millionaire. We looked at each other, there was a moment when we said, gut check, we really want to do what we're doing here. It's what we've been asked to do, we felt, which is wrong. It ran against, uh, some things we were asked to do ran against uh, our moral compass. We walked away. So we went from this nice 4,000 foot sort of house on the lake, started looking at the, uh, we take this family of three kids and move into a, uh, Double wide trailer. That was a gut check. Anyway, uh, the uh, entrepreneur and he said, You know, we can do this. We'll be okay. But thank heaven we got rescued by another headhunter who stepped back in and said, We've got a major corporation that's got a business unit that's struggling. You've got a reputation for putting business units back to the, where they need to be. Up and jumping on us. Well, actually, we've got two headhunters at the same time came at us. And uh, the other question was, How do you make the decision as to which one of those choices you take? And there's another good question for you. What is your decision criteria when it comes to those forks on the road? I mean, I like the philosophy of Yogi Berra. He said, you know, when you come to a fork on the road, take it. Yogi was my hero. Anyway, how do you, what's the decision criteria you're going to use? Let me suggest that that criteria ought to be one that serves the partnership. My partner's one of the corner here that kind of going to later. But it better serve the whole thing. If you've got a lot of angst running around the house, over the decision you've made, that's not going to last long. Or is it so they're saying, Mama ain't happy? Nobody's happy. Anyway, we took, uh, we took the move, and that turned out to be great. That turned out to be the Kraft General Foods. We very quickly understood that uh, 
My world needed to be that there's smaller business units where I could fix little business units, prepare some for sale, take some to what they needed to be in any group in the company, and that was fantastic. Learned a lot dealing with Kraft Channel Foods. Got to work with Murray Lander, as we put his business on the track it needed to be and then integrated it into the company. Got to work with the Edmund Brothers. There was a great step there. One was the master baker, the other guy was the financier, and between the two of them, a great balance, and they had a great company. But I love one of my favorite moments. We're in a corporate meeting. That's on Philip Morris on Kraft General Foods. And we had this room about this size with this big view. We had the consultants there, we had the hierarchy from Philip Morris Kraft General Foods, Kraft General Foods, and the Baker Corporation. And we were there to uh, look at EVA for the corporation, Economic Value Added, which is great services we thought. And it started with the introductions. And everybody in there, Suits that are more than I can afford around the room. Started well, I'm the executive vice president. The, the titles, it just got sick. I think it's the last guy over in the corner. We kind of helped everybody get their feet on the ground. It was our entrepreneur. That was William Emmett. Kind of frumpy, tie pulled down about two inches, sleeves rolled up, he looks up and goes, William Emmett, name on the box. Okay, you can take the ear out of it. Okay, don't let egos get out in front of you. Not in front of you, not in front of you. So anyway, the unit I was with uh, got sold before we could even close and an offer from ConAgra to come do some similar things with their organization, which we did. And uh, very successful in uh, a couple changes we made with ConAgra in two different business units. And then the uh, chairman and I sat down and had a tent and and he didn't want to do what I wanted to do. And so we said, it would be a good time to leave. We're both happy with each other, but we have directions that look in two different ways. Dr. Burke Cutterners, who landed me with Leonard Lavin at Alberta Culver, which was a really great run. And we have Ball, uh, share wise with the Whitney Procter Gamble, Unilever, L'Oreal, kind of frustrating those folks. And that was a lot of fun. And then Unilever said, well, you think I'm just going to buy you. And they wanted to know a few things, we'll talk about that in a second. But out of this thing, three major learnings, okay? First of all, the wrong way. There we go. First learning point is do the right thing. That really needs to be done. That little LBO on that when we thought it was a situation that we, it was untenable for us. A few years later, when the subpoena showed up, we knew we'd make the right decision. You never have to go back and backtrack yourself if you do the right thing. That always won't be the favorite, your favorite choice. It'll be the tough choice quite often. Um, it will save you a lot of pain later. I have watched individuals in business, entrepreneurs and corporately, have to go back and do damage control because they missed this one little absolute. Do the right thing. Always do the right thing. Second thing I'd suggest is be a student of your industry. My two favorite stories here. One is we're getting ready to sell a couple of orphan brands. Um, and we've got this corporate company and they're just great individuals who make a living out of buying orphan brands and doing what corporations could do with them. And they asked, they said, would you have your corporate teams for these three customers show up, which happened to be a third of the business. So the corporate teams came in for those three, They're sitting down talking, and here's our, our teams going, why do we get to do these? I don't ask you. And all of a sudden, they started to <coughs> The owners of these things actually ran the customer teams those top three accounts that were that close to the business. And quickly, our teams understood that these entrepreneurs knew more about those customers than these hot check teams. You really need to be a student of your business from the top to the bottom. The other one is Unilever Watts, the CEO of Unilever, when we did the management presentation, said, okay, we've got that, but here's what I want to know. What's the secret sauce? You guys have been nailing this share for years now. What's the secret sauce? What makes you guys so darn good? What we got across to them is that Unilever is extremely good and very successful packaged goods company. I believe that they've got scale like But what we could do in our category that they couldn't do, because they had guys that were in every day of the category you can think of. They were in ice cream, they were in tea, and I mean, they all over. Okay? We had two groups of people, nicely mentioned together. Yeah. One were nothing but retail operations people that understood retail ops and how to go to market. The second people were hair care people. They grew up from the salon, the beauty stores. We knew hair care like nobody knew hair care. 
That's why trust me and Nexus are so successful in the marketplace. And what we help them understand is you guys are good from one side, you're good cat package goods people. What you're not good at is the depth it takes to really have a beauty company. So know your business. All their scale, all Proctor's scale, couldn't be just on share because we knew beauty better. We were focused on students in our business. Be a student in your industry. Have solid financial understanding. We talked about that earlier. Really, you've got to understand finance. If you don't, if you don't understand cash and cash flow, don't become an entrepreneur. I promise you a painful existence. Okay? Really understand this. Okay? Now, the accounting piece, all right, you can get accounts that serve you, but you need to know cash and make payroll. You've got to know when and how money gets here and where it goes. You really need to understand cash management. So get the If I had to grab three things and say those are the, those are two, three, and four, right? There's one more we really, really want you to understand. It's the absolute critical factor, and we see a lot of this in our work now in consulting. Let me stop for a second. I don't care if you were working in a corporation, you're an entrepreneur, you're an individual, you are not independent. People always want to be totally independent. You're not. You're dependent on a lot of folks. Those top two, your investors, your bankers, your really critical customers, partners, you are never independent. You've got to be you know, responsive to other people. I had a corporate officer one time and I looked at him and I said, you're, uh, you're just not going to make it here. And he said, well, you know, I'm really bothered by that. He said, I felt like I got to this position, you know, I could just make my calls and I'd be, I said, wait a minute, everybody's responsible to somebody. We're responsible to a board. They're responsible to stop it. We're all responsible to somebody. You can't be on island by yourself. You've got to be interdependent. Okay? Independence does what? Okay? First of all, find that factor we're going to talk about that will increase your ability for those groups of people and others. Okay? The research suggests that anywhere between 58 and 66% of the required skills to succeed are in this factor. This is not the technical skills. This is not your analytical skills. This is not your engineering skills. These are the skills, two-thirds of the tools you need to be successful in your case. The absence of these is the single largest factor in executive derailment, which creates a lot of work for us and blood. It is the strongest predictor of success. And you've heard emotional intelligence. Some people call it EQ. Here's an neat thing. Your IQ is relatively fixed. That's not going to change. Your personality is somewhat inelastic. Your EQ can be developed. You can become much stronger with the skills you need to be interpersonally effective. We like to use the term emotional maturity. Why? Because you can talk to a person and say, well, you know, I'm not so good at the soft stuff. Let me tell you folks, I can decode that real quick. That means you're a train wreck with people. Goodbye, I'll go to the next candidate. Okay? Sam uh, Allen, CEO of Beer, uses that term, emotional maturity, because people will never look at him and say, well, I'm emotionally immature. Okay? They'll try to skirt around by saying, I'm not good at the soft stuff. It's not the soft stuff. <coughs> He'll tell his people, you've got a tremendous responsibility. You're the critical enabler, enabler Engagement, development of others, how you do it, that's of paramount importance. This is the kind of stuff that's impacted. This is why it's not the soft stuff. Okay? It really increases productivity. It makes decision making so much better in an organization. The deeper you get into understanding emotional intelligence, the more you get this. If you want to get real neat, uh, pick up Daniel Goldman's work. We're going to talk a little bit more soon. We're going to talk about some of Travis Stradbury's real simple stuff that I think is very helpful. Bottom line here is the results will improve. More importantly, it's the right thing to do. Okay? So in a nutshell, here's what emotional intelligence is. It's understanding and controlling our own emotions. It's thoughtfully choosing our actions and our comments. It's being aware of the feelings and emotions of others. All this to have the most effective relationship you can have with other people. How do you become personally effective? You've got to avoid the hijacking. Yeah, what do you mean, hijacking? Well, here's a statement. Your emotions can and do hijack conscious thought. Rational thought is beat to the punch by emotions. You want to believe it? Think back to a time when you read an email. By the way, emails have no tone. 
We put tone in them when we read them, right? So you're reading this email, and it offends you, it bothers you. Okay? Man, you just can't believe it. You jump up and sit down. A couple minutes later, you go, ah, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Or the comment, you snap back at some. Boom. Okay? What happens is your emotions kicked in before your rational thought kicked in. Okay? Your emotions hijacked you, and you let them do it. My brother veteran, take care. It's off to the veterans group. Smart. He came in and told us I'd be leaving midway in the two. Okay? Thoughtful. Emotions is over. So don't let your emotions hijack you. <coughs> now you're going to get a little deeper inside on the eye. The brains are out there. I hope you can all hear me. He has basically told you all about what we really want to talk to you about today, but he brought in lots of subjects. And one of the biggest things is this hijacking, all right? We have, in our little business that we have, have seen more um, executives as well as people moving up through the ranks of corporations and even entrepreneurs totally derail their businesses because they don't have the emotional intelligence that they need to be able to press forward. Okay? They don't know how to interact with other people in a, in a positive way. Or, in some cases, they have such knee-jerk reactions that people look at them and say, I don't even want to be around that person. So what we're going to do, what I'm going to do, is take a few minutes here, and I'm going to, I'm going to talk about a specific book that we really like. Um, and if you like the idea of emotional intelligence and you think it's something you need to work on, which most of us do, this book, Emotional Intelligence 2.0 by Travis Bradford, is really a great little primer to start you thinking along the right, right lines about who you are and how you interact with other people. Um, so, I'm going to do this. Okay, this is your brain. Fairly simple, all right? There's lots more components to it, but what I'm going to talk about is the fact that everything that you see, smell, hear, taste, touch, travels to your brain with, through electrical impulses or signals. And it starts at the core, the spinal cord, and it moves where you really want it to go, over here to the critical thinking area, or what I like to call, and it's the frontal lobe, is I think what they call it in the science classes that you may have taken. I like to call it executive function. Because this is where the rational thought is, is up here. But it has, to, it has to run through this system here, the limbic system, before it gets there. So let's talk for just a minute about this limbic system. Um, as those signals travel to the brain, through the spinal cord, up here, um, this limbic system is your emotional system. It's how I feel. Everything that goes in has to go through that before it gets to, well, I think. So it's more of an I feel than I think is kind of how it works. The limbic brain, and I'm going to read some of this because I can't really keep it all in my mind because it's technical stuff. The, the limbic brain may be the most important component that we have. Complex emotions from the limbic brain are one reason mammals dominate the earth and not reptiles. The reptilian brain, and we have a little piece of this in the limbic system, okay? The reptilian brain controls centers for fear and aggression. These are not a reptile, they're pretty aggressive, all right? The emotion, or the limbic brain, is the emotional part of the brain, and this is where the invention of love and joy and playfulness in mammals comes about. It's what gives us, as human beings, it allows us to love our young, to work well in the groups. Okay? Then we go to the frontal part of the brain, the frontal lobe, or the executive function, the rational part of the brain, the thinking part of the brain. That's where we find the language of thought and words. So all three parts are very important. They're all wired together. But most of the time, it is the emotion, or the limbic part of the brain, that hits first. Emotion is stronger than thought. 
And that's an important thing to keep in mind. Your emotions are stronger than the thoughts. The rational area of your brain cannot stop the emotion felt by the limbic system, but the two areas do influence each other and maintain constant communication. The communication between your emotional and rational brains is the physical source of your emotional intelligence. The communication between your emotional and your rational mind, okay, or brain, is the, the physical source of your emotional intelligence. Each one of us have our own emotional intelligence. A few minutes ago, he showed you, you know, your IQ, it stays pretty much the same throughout your life, right? Your personality, it's fairly inelastic. I mean, you know what? You might be able to change a little bit here and there. Or you might have a little personality that is with your group of friends of different personality, maybe at home. You know, but not a lot. Okay, so that's pretty inelastic. But emotional quotient, you can do a lot about it if you have the desire to. Um, so now that we've got that technical stuff out of the way. One of the things that I put in mind, and this is partly in Brad Berry's book, okay, um, he talks about these four key factors. Them being self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, and relationship management. I break it down even a little further. Where the personal factors are self-awareness and self-management. That's you. Nobody can fix that part. It's up to me to decide what needs to be fixed and how I can go about fixing it. The second part of, the, of this has to do with social awareness and um, relationship management. And this is broken down into this two, these two uh, core groups because they are not so much about you, but how you interact with other people. Your social awareness and your relationship management are critical, especially in the business world. And that doesn't matter if you're an entrepreneur or if you're in a corporate life or Honestly, even if you're a stay-at-home mom for a few years, your relationships with others are critical. Um, so let's go. We're going to go through each one of these. Just um, we're just going to go through each one of them for just a minute. Um, I have probably five times the amount of information um, that I could ever give to you, and that's why we are going to encourage you at the end of this lecture series too. If you're interested in this topic, to go onto the internet, you type in emotional intelligence, emotional quotient, uh, emotional maturity, any of those things, and you're going to come up with lots of different ideas from lots of different people. And dive into some of them, because we can't give you everything in, in a 15-minute lecture. Um, so let's start with self-awareness. First of all, who you are. You've got to know who you are. And it's not just that fun thing of, oh, I'm a real morning person, or no, I'm a night owl. I'll be up to all hours of the night. You've got to peel back the layers and figure out who the middle part of you really is. Um, Self-awareness is your ability to accurately perceive your own emotions in the moment that you need to and understand your tendencies in each situation. The only way to become self-aware is to spend time analyzing how you react emotionally to different situations, and I would add, to, to different people. And I'll just throw one out there, okay? We have one of our daughters, we have four daughters, one of our daughters, in her teenage years, had the most irritating way of yelling down the stairs, Mom! And the minute she would yell downstairs like, Mom, I would get my gander up. I would just start going, now what does she want, all right? I wasn't very emotionally mature at the moment when it came to that because she had that way of grading at me. We all have somebody that grades at us that way. We have to learn how to deal with that person. I've learned greatly how to deal with her, okay? She and I are best friends to this day. But there were times when she really graded at me and I had to learn, I had to grow up if you want to put it that way. Um, those who have high emotional self-awareness are remarkably clear in their understanding of what they do well, what motivates them, what satisfies them, and which people or situations push their buttons. 
But that takes that, what I call peeling back the layers and understanding who you really are and why those emotions get to you. When you are self-aware, you will be far more likely to pursue the right opportunities for your strengths. And, and even more so, you will be able to keep your emotions from holding back your life pursuits. In our world today, and we just, again, on Sunday, witnessed a shooting in the church, okay? In our world today, we really need a lot more self-awareness, individual self-awareness. Because, as I said, this is something that we can't all, nobody can do it for you. You have to do this for yourself. So that comes to the second part of this personal, and that is self-management. Self-management is pretty easy. It happens when you act or when you don't act. It is dependent on your own self-awareness and is the second major part of this personal component. The tool is of the utmost importance as it is your ability to use your awareness of your emotions to stay flexible and direct your behavior in a positive manner. The other guy may be so irate and on such a tear, but you have responsibility for yourself and how you react to something. And hopefully that reaction will be in a positive manner. The means of managing your emotional reaction to situations and to people got to be able to self-manage. Um, self-management is more than just resisting explosive and problematic behavior. It begins with obvious and momentary opportunities of self-control. So both of these factors, self-awareness as, as well as self-management, is all up to you. And one of the best things you can do is start reacting, to see, start watching your reactions to other people. One of Bradbury's things that he says, and I really like this, is he says, start watching movies. Start watching television shows. Look at the emotions that are going on in those shows. If you start watching those emotions, you're going to be able to, to calibrate where you're at on that emotional scale. And hopefully, you'll become more self-aware of that. So that when you get into a, so, a situation where you're standing there talking to someone and you're in the heat of a, a, of a discussion, you'll be able to say, oh, you know, I remember watching this movie. You know, your mind's going, I remember watching this movie, and this is how that was so This is how I should maybe react towards this. Okay, so just become more self-aware. Um, the realization of, your, of goals oftentimes in self-management are delayed. That means that your, your commitment to managing your emotions is going to be tested over and over and over. We all know that, okay? I mean, just think back of some of the situations that you've been in. That you, you're tested over and over with that same. Uh, patience is one of my problems, okay? I wanted everything yesterday. I have to be careful and watch how I interact with other people when I ask them to do something for me. I can't say I want it done yesterday. I have to give them time to be able to do that. Um, success comes to those who can put their needs on hold and continually manage their emotional tendencies. So that's probably... So, the next thing we're going to do, we're going to talk about social awareness. This is where you interact with lots of other people. Um, social awareness is your ability to accurately pick up on emotions in other people and understand what is going on with them. You know, some of you may walk, have walked into this classroom today having had horrible news from home this morning. But they came to class anyway. But then all of a sudden, they may look at you and just explode or just melt down into tears. You've got to look at that person and you've got to say, okay, I've got to give you the benefit of the doubt. Now, okay, Stephen Covey, um, Stephen Covey always used the term um, understanding, seek to understand, okay? Seek to understand what's going on with the other person. Um, one of the things I like here, you've got to practice all of these a lot, but one of the things, um, I know you've all been in this situation. Um, you're at a meeting. 
Um, you're in a meeting or a group activity, and there's one person there that is determined to make their point and make their point in such a way that everybody in the group is going to agree with. But we all know that that basically isn't going to happen. We don't all always agree on everything. What the person does is, though, they totally miss the mood or the shift in attitude towards them, and they end up diluting what they're talking about and also probably being totally ineffective with the group. That group is sitting out back and they're saying, I don't want to be around this person very much anymore. We see this constantly in our work, especially with corporations, okay, that there's one person that comes into that meeting and they have it my way. Life doesn't work that way. Even if you're an entrepreneur and you sit at the top, you still have to listen to other people. You still have to work with other people. Um, one of the things you need to do is you need to practice watching other people. As you interact with them and get a good sense of what they really think and feel, your social awareness will be able to spot and understand people's emotions while you're in the middle of a situation. And then even though you are contributing part of that con um, conversation or situation, you will be able to interact with them in, in an emotionally positive manner. One of the things that we have to do in social awareness is we have to listen and observe. Those are two, the two most important things you can do in a social environment. Listen and observe. There's some things that you've got to stop doing. When you're in a situation, you have to, you need to stop talking yourself. You need to stop the monologue that's running through your brain. We all do it. We're sitting there, somebody's talking about something, and in our mind, we're, we're, we're running through, what are we going to say next? We're running through our mind, well, what's their end point? We have to stop thinking ahead about what we're going to say next and we need to listen and observe. And this takes a tremendous amount of pra uh, practice. One of the things, um, again, this little primer, the first 54 pages are super simple, fast reading, a lot of basically what, what I've been talking about. The last part, you see the little parts that have gray tabs on them? Those actually have to do with these four things that we're talking about. And in there are ways to teach yourself to be more emotionally, um, emotionally intelligent. The last slide that we're going to talk about is, um, is relationship management. And relationship management, well, of course, we're talking here business situations, okay? But honestly, this is every bit of your life. This happens in your dorms, this happens with your roommates, this happens with your spouses, this happens with your families at home, this happens with your own family, you have a family here. Relationship management takes in all these other things that we've been talking about. This ensures clear communication and effective handling of your emotions and conflict. Relationship management is also the bond you build with others over time. People who manage relationships well are able to, be, to see uh, a benefit of connection between many different kinds of people. They, they learn diversity. <clears throat> uh, solid relationships are, um, are something that are sought after. Um, long term, okay? Um, you need to have friends, okay? You're involved in a family, you have no choice in most cases with that. But you, know, you need to know how to handle those situations. And oftentimes, it's that long-term relationship. It's sometimes the things that you've said in the past that come back to haunt you. Again, that's where your emotions have hijacked the relationship. Solid relationships are something that should be sought after and cherished. Um, if you want people to listen, you have to practice relationship management and seek a benefit from every relationship, especially the challenging ones. You may have a sibling that you just don't get along with, but you've got to manage that relationship so that it's not ever destroyed. Um, to build a relationship, you must devote yourself in quality time, depth of construction, constructive conversation, 
and activities, and the amount of time interacting with that person. Some of the most stressful situations people face are in the workplace. And face it, that's where you'll spend a good, time, a good part of your life. These workplace conflicts fester and fester and fester. And then they tend to explode, and people can't manage their anger and their frustration, and they end up taking it out on other people. Um, if you learn to manage your relationships, you will have the ability to make the most of your interactions with other people, especially those people that you are challenged with or challenged by. Um, in today's challenging, competitive, connected, fast-paced, economically turbulent world, we each need to be more emotionally intelligent, emotionally mature. We need to be the ones that take the higher road. Because not everybody's going to do this. I have one example that I'll throw out, and then I'm hopefully we'll going to look at some questions. Um, we know of a young man who, in his field, is probably technically superior to most everyone else in this field. Okay? But because of his lack of emotional maturity, He has never, ever been able to succeed. He's in his mid-40s at this point. He has gone from position to position. He has had long periods of not being able to find work, having to take just very medial jobs. And even though he is so technically astute, he is such a, he's a term for a trained medical with people, that he's basically lost everything at this point. It's because he won't be here to. And we've actually brought this up to him. And he says, no, we're the ones that have the emotional and challenge problems. Okay? So understand that it can hijack or derail your entire career if you are not emotionally mature. I'm going to leave you with this last slide. Okay? Aristotle said this. He said, anyone can become angry. That is really easy. But to be angry with the right person, to the right degree, at the right time, for the right purpose, and in the right way, that is not easy. And that's emotional intelligence. So, <clears throat> we uh, met earlier this morning with Janet and Mary, and they said just for being here this afternoon, that we could confer on everybody in this group the graduate degree from MSU. And that's the school of making stuff up. <laughs> now, I'll tell you what, you know, you know everyone is going to make stuff up. Let me give you a couple examples. You ever heard of this one? Well, let me tell you why she. Okay? It's the first time I tell you they're in the front of a person's head and they understand totally why. No, they're making it up. Law enforcement. They get to a scene of an accident or a crime and they're taking you know, statements from witnesses and they go back and they look at well, these people are laying on the scene, right? And the stuff doesn't jive. Okay? We all make stuff up. Here's what happens. We have filters because of our experience, our biases, okay, the things that have gone on in our life. We add filters. When we look at objective reality, okay, we filter. So I give you an example. We usually at this point have someone walk in the door and they start, oh, here's the papers you want, they stop and go, oh, that time, I'm sorry. And then they walk by. And we ask people, what just happened? And let me give you the answer to you, okay? Now she was rude, she didn't think you didn't like that person based on looking at your face, da 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 da. She goes, stop. All that's what you made up, making stuff up. Objective reality, two people passed, one person spoke, the other one did not. Really, that's all that happens. But boy, we layer on the understanding that we make stuff up. So, let me tell you something that we offer all our people as a suggestion. This is one tool I think you'll find very helpful. Anytime you are feeling other than positive or neutral, if you're feeling positive or neutral, you're probably on a pretty good course. If you are feeling other than positive or neutral, learn to recognize that. Three things. First, stop. Okay? Second thing, challenge. What are you making up? Okay? This is a chance to get out of the limbic system, get up from below. Okay? And then, relationship management. Choose the most constructive path forward. So again, your graduate degree says, anytime you're feeling other than positive or neutral, stop. Challenge what you tell yourself. Choose a positive path forward. We think that will help you in all that you do.
we ran longer than we meant to. We want to take as many questions as we can until you're on the force side here. Go. It's yours. Questions? I'm going to get it way easy. <laughs> questions for her. We threw a lot of stuff at you. Yeah. You mentioned you have a consulting firm. Yep. What do you consult with? We do three things. Uh, the work we do together is around emotional intelligence and corporate events. Okay? We do executive coaching, and then I do, uh, and then she does work with corporate spouse groups. Okay? And then I do work on leadership and marketing, and every now and then international business. Our real focus is around this emotional intelligence thing, being leaders more effective, and trying to get leaders to be the kind of people we would like to be in our children. Would that overlap with Yes, yeah, we do a lot of work with corporate culture, and we enjoy that a lot. Yes? Um, you have like a strategy for how you can do that? Yeah, we have a strategy for how you can do that. Yeah, we have a strategy for how you can do that. Yeah, we have a strategy for how you can do that. Thank you for asking. In fact, this book, by the way, not an expensive book, this is not high academic work. No. There's a little forms on the book in the back. When you open it, you can go online and take about a seven minute test. It's going to give you back about a 14 page readout. Okay? And it's going to focus you on some tools that are in here, some toolbox. Okay? And then that allows you to take it twice. You can go back another time and take it again and see what kind of progress you've made. Um, so, yes, I, and once again, we like this because it's simple. You can read it on a flight from here in Salt Lake. Okay? But it's a great little toolbox. Another book I would read uh, would be The Art of Self Deception. Uh, it's an outstanding book. Yeah, question over here. Yep. Yeah, um, before you started, they said that you were an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur. Yep. What was that about? I like that. Thank you for the question. The entrepreneur we define as the ability to run small business units with inside larger corporations. Okay? So I have the resources of, you know, whether it be Kraft General Foods or Kayagra or uh, Frito Lay, but the small business units they have that are kind of peripheral. Okay? Running those gets to be very entrepreneurial. And this is where you learn. I don't know the secrets of being honest here or right here. Okay, ask permission. Okay, no. Ask forgiveness. Later you can ask permission. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so as you're starting out, um, when developing your emotional intelligence, what would be the easiest improvement to make to start with that? Just self-awareness. Yeah. Start immediately by watching yourself when you're in a situation that all of a sudden your emotions take over. Watch that. Then go back and reevaluate. You know, ask your questions like, why did I say that? Why did I get so angry at him at that moment? Um, why did I treat him the way I did in that situation? So start, start becoming, that's the very key to the whole thing, is becoming aware of who you are, what your emotions are, and, that, and what triggers your emotions. Very great little profile here will guide you very nicely if you want to get involved with that. Thank you. You bet. Other questions? Thanks, Tyler. Thank you. Thank you.